The Disappearance of the Universe by Gary R. Renard There are those who have reached God directly, retaining no trace of worldly limits and remembering their own identity perfectly. This might be called the teachers of teachers because, although they are no longer visible, their image can yet be called upon. And they will appear when and where it is helpful for them to do so. To those to whom such appearances would be frightening, they give their ideas. No one can call on them in vain, nor is there anyone of whom they are unaware. A Course in Miracles Part 1 A Whisper in Your Dream Chapter 1 Arten and Persa appear. Communication is not limited to the small range of channels the world recognizes, a course in miracles. During Christmas week of 1992, I realized that the circumstances of my life and my state of mind had been slowly improving for about a year. At the previous Christmas, things had not been going well at all. Then, I had been deeply troubled by the apparent scarcity in my life. Although I had been successful as a professional musician, I had not managed to save much money. I was struggling in my new career as a stock market trader, and I was in the process of suing a friend and former business partner whom I felt had treated me unfairly. Meanwhile, I was still in the process of recovering from a bankruptcy four years earlier, the result of impatience, reckless spending, and seemingly good investments gone bad. I didn't know it, but I was at war with myself, and I was losing. I also didn't know back then that practically all people are at war and losing, even when they appear to be winning. Suddenly, something shifted deep within me. For 13 years, I had been on a spiritual search, during which I had learned a great deal without really taking the time to apply my lessons, but now a new certainty swept over me. Things have got to change, I thought. There's got to be a better way than this. I wrote to the friend I was suing and informed him that I was dropping my legal action in order to start removing conflict from my life. He called and thanked me, and we began to rebuild our friendship. Eventually, I would learn that this same kind of scenario, in different forms, had played itself out thousands of times in the previous few decades as some people in conflict had begun a process of laying down their weapons and surrendering to a greater wisdom within themselves. Then I began trying to activate forgiveness and love, as I understood them at the time, in the situations that confronted me on any given day. I had some good results and some very tough difficulties especially when someone pushed my buttons in just the right or wrong way. But at least I felt like I was beginning to change direction. During this period, I began noticing little flashes of light out of the corner of my eye or occurring around certain objects. These crystal clear light flashes did not take up my entire field of vision but were concentrated on particular areas. I wouldn't understand what they meant until it was explained to me later. Through this year of change, I regularly prayed to Jesus, the prophet of wisdom, whom I admired more than anyone else, to help me. I felt a mysterious connection to Jesus, and in my prayers I often told him, how I wished that I could go back 2,000 years and be a follower of His, so I could know what it was really like to learn from Him in person. 
Then, that Christmas week of 1992, something most unusual happened while I was meditating in my living room in a rural area of Maine. I was all alone because I worked at home and my wife Karen commuted to Lewiston. We had no children and thus I enjoyed a very quiet environment except for the occasional barking of our dog, Nappy. As my mind drifted back from meditation, I opened my eyes and was stunned to see that I was not alone. With my mouth open but no sound coming out, I stared across the room at a man and a woman sitting on my couch, looking directly at me with gentle smiles and lucid penetrating eyes. There was nothing threatening about them. In fact, they looked extraordinarily peaceful, which I found reassuring. Looking back on the event, I would wonder why I had not been more fearful, given that these very solid-looking people had apparently materialized out of nowhere. Still, this first appearance by my soon-to-be friends was so surreal that fear somehow didn't seem appropriate. The two people looked to me in their thirties and very healthy. Their clothing was stylish and contemporary. They didn't look anything like I might have imagined that angels or ascended masters or any other kind of divine beings might look. There was no illumination or glowing aura around them. One could have spotted them in a restaurant eating dinner and not given them a second thought. But I couldn't help but notice them sitting there on my couch and I found myself looking at the attractive woman more than the man. Noticing this, the woman spoke first. Hello, my dear brother. I can see you are astonished but not really afraid. I am Persa. And this is our brother Arden. We are appearing to you as symbols whose words will help facilitate the disappearance of the universe. I say we are symbols because anything that appears to take on a form is symbolic. The only true reality is God or pure spirit, which in heaven are synonymous and God and pure spirit have no form. Thus, there is no concept of male or female in heaven. Any form, including your own body, that is experienced in the false universe of perception, must by definition be symbolic of something else. That is the real meaning of the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Must biblical scholar have always considered that particular commandment to be a mystery. Why would God not want you to make any images of him? Moses thought that the idea was to get rid of pagan idolatry. The real meaning is that you shouldn't make up any images of God because God has no image. That idea is central to what we'll be telling you later. Do you want to run that by me again? We'll be repeating things enough for you to pick them up, Gary. And one of the things you'll notice is that we'll speak to you more and more in your own style of language. In fact, we're going to put things to you very bluntly. We think you're big enough to handle it, and we didn't come here to waste time. You asked Jesus for help. He would have been happy to come to you himself. But that's not what's called for right now. We're his representatives. By the way, most of the time, we're just going to refer to Jesus as Jay. We have permission from him to do that, and we'll tell you why when the time is right. You wanted to know what it was like to be there with him 2,000 years ago. We were there, and we'll be happy to tell you. Although you may be surprised to find out there are more advantages to being a student of his today than there were back then. One thing we're going to do 
is challenge you the way Jay repeatedly challenged us, whether in the past or in what you think of as the future. We're not going to be easy on you or tell you what you want to hear. If you want to be handled with kid gloves, then go to a theme park. If you're ready to be treated as an adult who has a right to know why nothing in your universe can possibly work in the long run, then we'll get down to business. You will also learn both the cause of this situation and the way out of it. So what do you say? I don't know what to say. Excellent. A fine qualification for a student. Another one being the desire to learn. I know you have that. I also know you don't like to talk very much. You're the kind of guy who could go into a monastery for years and not say a word. You also have an exceptional memory, something that will come in handy for you later. In fact, we know everything about you. Everything? Yes, everything. But we're not here to judge you, so there's no sense in hiding things or being embarrassed. We're here simply because it's helpful for us to appear right now. Take advantage of us while you can. Ask any questions that come into your mind. You were wondering why we look this way. The answer is that we like to fit in wherever we go. Also, we dress in a secular fashion because we don't represent any particular religion or denomination. So you are not Jehovah's Witnesses then, because I already told them I'm not into organized churches. We are certainly witnesses for God, but Jehovah's Witnesses subscribe to the old belief that except for a select number who will be with him, God's kingdom will be on earth with them in glorified bodies, and that is not what we teach. We may disagree with the teachings of others, but we don't judge them and respect the right of all people to believe what they want. That's cool, but I don't know if I like this idea of no male and female in heaven. There are no differences in heaven and no changes. Everything is constant. That's the only way it can be completely dependable instead of chaotic. Isn't that kind of boring? Let me ask you something, Gary. Is sex boring? Not in my book. Well, imagine the very peak of a perfect sexual orgasm, except this orgasm never stops. It keeps going on forever with no decrease in its powerful and flawless intensity. You have my attention. The physical act of sex doesn't even come close to the incredible bliss of heaven. It's just a poor made-up imitation of union with God. It's a false idol made to fix your attention on the body and the world with just enough of a payoff to keep you coming back for more. It's very similar to a narcotic. Heaven, on the other hand, is a perfect, indescribable ecstasy that never ceases. That sounds beautiful, but it doesn't account for all these experiences people have of the other side. Out-of-body trips, near-death experiences, communicating with people who have passed on, and things of that nature. What you call this side and the other side are really just two sides of the same illusory coin. It's all the universe of perception. When your body appears to stop and die, your mind keeps right on going. You like to go to the movies, right? Everyone should have a hobby. When you make a transition from one side to the other, whether from this life to the afterlife, or back to a body again, it's like walking out of one movie and into a different one. Except these films are more like the virtual reality movies people will have in the future, where everything will seem completely real, right down to the touch. That reminds me of this article I read 
about a machine in a lab at MIT that you can put your finger in and feel things that aren't there. Is that the kind of technology you are talking about? Yes. Most inventions mimic some aspect of what the mind does. Getting back to the birth and death cycle, when you are seemingly born once again into a physical body, you forget everything, or at least most of it. It's all a trick of the mind. Are you trying to tell me my life is all in my head? It's all in your mind. My head is in my mind? Your head, your brain, your body, your world, your entire universe, any parallel universes and anything else that can be perceived are projections of the mind. They are all symbolic of just one thought. We will tell you what that thought is later. Our even better way of thinking about this is to consider your universe to be a dream. It feels pretty solid to be a dream, Paul. We'll tell you later why it feels solid, but you need more background first. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. What Persa was trying to impress on you is that nobody is asking you to give up a lot in exchange for nothing. It's really the opposite. You will eventually come to realize that you are giving up nothing in exchange for everything, a state so awesome and joyous that to describe it in words is impossible. To attain this state of being, however, you must be willing to undergo a difficult process of correction by the Holy Spirit. This correction you speak of, does it have anything to do with political correctness? No. Political correctness, no matter how well-intentioned, is still an attack on freedom of speech. You will find we are very free with our speech indeed. The word correction is not used by us in the usual way, because to correct something usually means you fix it up and keep it. When the false universe is finished being corrected by the Holy Spirit, it will no longer appear to exist. I say it will no longer appear to exist because it does not exist in reality. The true universe is God's universe or heaven, and heaven has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the false universe. However, there is a way of looking at your universe that will help you return to your true home with God. You're talking about the universe like it's some kind of a mistake. But the Bible says that God created the world, and most everybody believes he did, not to mention all the world's religions. My friends and I think that God produced the world so he could know himself experimentally, which I guess is a pretty common New Age belief. Didn't God create polarity, duality, and all of the opposites in this world of subject and object? In a word, no. God did not create duality and he did not create the world. If he did, he would be the author of a tale told by an idiot, to borrow Shakespeare's description of life. But God is not an idiot. We'll prove it to you. He can only be one of two things. He is either perfect love, as the Bible says when it momentarily stumbles upon the truth, or he's an idiot. You can't have it both ways. Jay was no idiot either, because he wasn't taken in by the false universe. We'll be telling you more about him, but don't expect the official version. Do you remember the story about the prodigal son? Sure. Well, I could probably use a refresher. Grab your New Testament there and read it to us. Then we'll explain something to you. But leave off the last paragraph. Why should I leave off the last paragraph? It was added on later, as the story got passed around during the oral tradition. Then it was changed some more, 
by the doctor who wrote both the book of Luke and the book of Acts. All right, I give you the benefit of doubt for now. Is the Revised Standard Version good enough? Yes, it's practical. Go to Luke 15:11. Okay, now this is Jesus talking, right? Yes. Ye doesn't speak that much in the Bible, and when he does, he's often misquoted. He was misquoted and misunderstood by everyone right from the beginning, including us. We understood him better than most, but we still had a lot to learn. We're speaking to you now with the benefit of subsequent learning, but Jay was misquoted most often for the purposes of the individual novels that became the mainstream Gospels. They were the popular stories of their time. Jay didn't say a lot of the things he's quoted as saying in these books, but did say some of them. Just as he didn't do most of the things he's portrayed as doing in these books, but did do a few of them. You mean like one of those TV movies where they say it's based on a true story, but most of it's made up? Yes, very good. The other half of the New Testament comes almost entirely from the Apostle Paul, who was a real crowd pleaser, but didn't really teach the same things as Jay. None of the people who wrote the Bible ever even met Jay, except for the author of Mark, who was just a child at the time that he met him. Look at the book of Revelation. It reads like a Stephen King story. Imagine portraying Jay as a warrior leader riding on a white horse and wearing a robe dipped in blood. No, he's not a spiritual warrior, a term that's an oxymoron, if there ever was one. One more question before the story, if you don't mind. Go right ahead, we are not in a hurry. Isn't the idea that God didn't create the world a Gnostic belief? The principle certainly did not originate with the Gnostics, predating them in other philosophies and religions. As far as the Gnostic sects are concerned, they were right in believing God did not create this excuse for a world, but they made the same error that almost everybody else does. They made the miscreated world psychological real for themselves. They saw it as an evil to be despised. Jay, on the other hand, viewed the world as the Holy Spirit sees it, a perfect opportunity for forgiveness and salvation. So rather than resisting the world, I should use it as a chance to get home? Exactly. Good boy. Jay used to say, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who you think is evil. Not only was that a shocking and direct refutation of the old scripture, but it was also the answer to the question you just asked. To further demonstrate Jay's attitude, why don't you read the story now? All right. I'm a little rusty at this, but here it goes. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pots that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, 
but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. <laughs> 